My name is Daniel Adam Fink. In this video, I am going to show you how I found the names of all of the provinces of Egypt called B'nai Mitzrayim in the Bible in Genesis 10 verses 13 and 14. The key to understanding Biblical Egypt is in the names listed in Genesis 10 verses 13 toward the end of the verse. The verse is Genesis 10 13 and Mitzrayim begot Ludim and Anamim. Now the most important provinces are and Lahabim and Neptachim and Patrasim. The key words are how you figure out where all the locations in Egypt in Genesis 10 and the entire Bible are located. On the left at the bottom I have a column of names, then their keywords and what their locations are. On the left, the three names, Lahabim, Neptachim, and Patrasim. The keywords. Lahab means knife or blade. Neptachim, the name Neftis, is the key to how I found all of Egypt. And Patrasi means south. People had already known, scholars, Egyptologists, researchers, that Patros means south. You can see that on a number of websites. And so I realized from there, which was the only known name out of all seven, I'm going to have to find its relationship with other names so I can find the other locations. As it turns out, Lahabim is knife. That is the Fayum Oasis, which is a very large and important oasis, the largest and most important reservoir in Egyptian history. It begins at a place called the Knife Nome. Neftachim, Neftis, goes from the Neftis Temple onward through Middle Egypt. That one was easy, and that led me to everything else. Because Patros simply means south, that is the, the Thebid, southern upper Egypt. As this slide indicates, Patros was the only understood word out of seven names within Egypt. It's a uh, letters P-T-R-S-Y in English. There's a debate on how they're pronounced in Egyptian. However, the pronunciation rules of ancient Hebrew makes them patrasim. That means south. So Egypt ended at the Aswan, which now has the Aswan High Dam. That was classical era Egypt. Scholars knew that this means upper Egypt. However, they did not know Neptachim. Because they did not know Neptachim, they had no idea how far Patros extended. They knew that it went all the way south. So, theories up until now had Neptachim located all over the map, which did not lead directly to 1, 2, 3, or 4 before Patros. There was, however, a clue to seven and six. Seven is the Kaptarim, and Kaptar is the Levantine Sea, it's the Eastern Mediterranean. The majority of theorists were guessing that Kaptar means Crete. However, I'll show you a map later which clearly shows uh, Crete is an island of current Greece. Crete is definitely not in Egypt, so difficult to explain why people would conclude that part of Egypt was part of Greece, especially because one of the versions of the Bible, the Septuagint, was written in Greek. So Hebrews would not be telling Greeks that part of Egypt was in Greece. That's, that's not a conclusion that leads in any direction. Also in the Bible, the Philistine have been debated to be descended from the Kaslachim or the Keftarim. Either way, and as it turns out, it's both, but primarily the Keftarim, that locates those names toward Philistia. 
leaving one, two, three, and four as the chief mysteries. Genesis 10 verse 14 helps us with the first four for one reason. And Kaslachim, these went forth from there, Pelashtim and Keftarim. So we know that Keftar is the Mediterranean and the Philistines are on the Mediterranean. Which leaves us to conclude that there is a disjunct between Patros and Kaslach, which happens to be true. Therefore, the best way to find 1, 2, 3, and 4, Ludim, Onamim, Lahabim, and Neftachim, is to go straight to Neftachim from Patros and work our way backward from 5 down to 1. This is what I did, and Neftachim is how I found every name in Egypt. This map is useful to give a perspective. In our modern day and age, we are used to thinking of seas in terms of the great oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian, during Biblical times, the big sea, the great sea, was the Mediterranean. Within the Mediterranean are numbers of smaller named seas. As you notice on this map, all over the Mediterranean, different parts of it, different basins are called things like the Aegean Sea, the Adriatic Sea, the Tyrrhenian Sea. The large body of the Mediterranean had named seas within it. So we go to the rounded white rectangle bottom right. That is the Sea of Kaftar. It's called the Levantine Sea. Levant means rising. It's the direction of the sunrise. So the eastern end of the Mediterranean is Canaan. So we think of that as Modern Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, the Hatay province of Turkey, that's the Levant, that's the Levantine Sea. It continues from there along the coast of Egypt and the southern extent of Greece, which is Crete. So, you have Crete located, Egypt located, Philistia located, southern Anatolia, all located in the Sea of Keftar, which explains to you... The Keftarim are certainly located on the Mediterranean. In the bottom right corner of this map, we see number five, Patros, with a dashed line to the Sea of the Philistines, which is a Sea of Keftar, letting us know if we are pursuing knowledge of the relationship with Patros and the other names, then we should go in the opposite direction from five to four. Neftachim, the key to unlocking all of Biblical Egypt. This is how I started to solve the entire map. There is a resource called McClintock and Strong's Biblical Cyclopedia. It is the greatest Biblical research tool. McClintock and Strong were a pair of Methodists who wrote, in my opinion, the greatest work for biblical knowledge and biblical research. Once I noticed that Neftahim sounded very much like Neftis, I went to the internet to research what people have been calling Naftuhim. When you look at McClintock and Strong's Biblical Cyclopedia, they came to the same conclusion that I had. Top left in green, there's a box in black. McClintock and Strong state how Bohart compares Nephthys, the name of the Egyptian goddess, sister wife of Typhon. Later, she was a sister wife of Shet. So I read their article and realized these people and Bohart and I all agree Nephthahim is Nephthys. It's not complicated. That's a cognate. It's the same word, slightly different in Egyptian, Greek, and Hebrew but generally just about exactly the same. So, I then realized Ashur is the temple of Ashur in Assyria. There's going to be a Nephthys temple. So I looked up Nephthys temple. Let's continue down to the lower left, not the bottom left, but lower left, World History Encyclopedia. By the time of Ramesses II, 
Nephthys was so popular, she was given her own temple at the popular religious center of Supermaru. Great. Now I need to find Supermaru. It's just that simple. Bottom left, I have Wikipedia. For a reason. People sometimes cringe or find that you will have low credibility when you mention Wikipedia. This is not so. Wikipedia contains useful information of general knowledge. When you get to specific articles of biblical names, often they are in error. Now, keep this in mind. When you find an error in Wikipedia or McClintock and Strong's Biblical Cyclopedia, it's important you can learn from it. There is a reason for the error. The error is a clue. It's a lead. It could be near the truth, and you research in that direction. If it's completely off, then it's a lead in a different direction. In this case, we're talking general knowledge, and so it's perfect because this explains how easy it has been and how easy it is to understand all along. New Kingdom Cults the Ramesside pharaohs were particularly devoted to Shet's prerogatives, and in the 19th dynasty, a temple of Nephthys called the House of Nephthys of Ramesses Mary Amun was built or refurbished in the town of Supermaru. So now, I know there is a popular Nephthys temple. I know it's in Supermaru, which was mentioned in World History Encyclopedia. This gets better. Midway between Oxyrhynchus and Heracleopolis on the outskirts of Fayum. So there's two great pieces of information. It's between Oxyrhynchus and Heracleopolis, and also on the outskirts of Fayum. Keep Fayum on the back burner. Let's go to Oxyrhynchus and Heracleopolis. Look at the map on the right. This is Google Maps. Oxyrhynchus and Heracleopolis Magna are on it. Let's go to the bottom center of the Google Maps map on the right, the first box in red inside of it and if you're on your smartphone you may need to zoom in or you can always just see this on Google Maps that's the Theban necropolis Thebes was the capital city of Patros which is south upper Egypt next to that red box we have number five we're going to now go to number four and locate the boundary the border of Neptahim if we follow the green shape, which is the Nile, or the blue dots, which is a walking directions, we go up north. The very next name in a red box is Oxyrhynchus, which is mentioned in the article as being on one side of Supermaru. Next to that, I have number four, Neptahim beyond Nephthys Temple. So we must be getting near the Nephthys Temple, as you probably have already seen. From Oxyrhynchus, immediately above it to the north is a temple icon next to which I have the word Supermaru. That is the location of Supermaru. You can see Supermaru maps online. It can't be queried on Google Maps, but that is the location. Just north of there is Heracleopolis Magna in the next red box. So, where the Supermaru temple is... You look at the temple icon, immediately left and right of it are dotted lines from Google Maps, next to which I have a dashed line arrow. That is a border of governorates of Egypt, which exist to this day. This border has been a border between Greater Fayum and Middle Egypt since at least 250 B.C. At the very minimum, 2,250 years, this has been an important border. So from Sepermaru south is Neptahim. At the southern end of Egypt is Patrasim. Between the two of them, the border would grow and shrink depending on how powerful was Thebes, how powerful were the city-states of Middle Egypt. Egypt was not always a united kingdom. Sometimes it could have three, four, five different kingdoms within Egypt. And sometimes a leader was powerful enough to unite all of Egypt. So, at the center 
of this Google Maps, there's that temple, Sapir Maru, just north of there, Heracleopolis Magna. North of there, we see a green leaf shape with a crocodile in it. A lake next to which says Fayum. That is the Fayum, which was, which was named in the Wikipedia article. Fayum is the important key to finding Lahabim. So, once I had realized Patrasim and Neptahim, I found that it was the border, not only of provinces of ancient Egypt, but of governorates which exist today. I knew that Fayum had to have some link to a Lahab, a knife. Now, going from Fayum, Heracleopolis Magna, the crocodile, up the Nile to the name in a red box, the furthest north name in a red box, that's Memphis. Below there you see an icon, a knife icon. And to the left of the knife icon, a dashed line from Google Maps, the border of a governorate, and a red dashed line from me. This is the most important line in Egypt, and this is how I knew I was correct about Nebuchadnezzar, the Habim, and the entire order of Egypt. Wrapping up the pivotal clues. To the middle of the B'nai Mitzrayim, the provinces of Egypt, and leading toward two and one. On the left side of this slide are a list of districts. Egypt was divided into districts which were called gnomes. Now, from an Egyptian point of view, the Nile flows northward. The southern end, the bottom end, is Upper Egypt. This is the place where Egyptian culture emerged around Thebes many thousands of years ago. So their numbering system goes from one at the bottom of the yellow map on the left from Aswan. The numbers go north and in the center you can see I have listed these gnomes, these 22 districts, and I have listed their names. So as we go from the bottom Let's go to the center column of numbers and names. At the bottom center, we see one bow. Let's go up to the furthest north, the top, number 22. The name of the 22nd gnome of Upper Egypt is Knife. Lahabim are the people from the Knife gnome. Think of the knife as cutting Egypt in half. This is extraordinarily important. It's the most important line in Egypt because Egypt was divided into two halves, Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt. Lower Egypt, so you have to think of this from an Egyptian point of view, Lower is North, which throws people sometimes. Lower Egypt is North, begins north of that dividing line. So the gnomes go 1 to 22 from the bottom by Aswan, just south of Memphis. Memphis is the great city of Egyptian history. It is the gnome which begins Lower Egypt. Let's go to the right on Google Maps. It's beginning from the bottom, because this is Egypt, this is where we begin. There are two sets of numbers. Numbers of Upper Egypt, numbers of Lower Egypt. So on the right, the furthest south, the lowest box, that's good old Oxyrhynchus. That is where Gnome 19 begins. As you remember, just north of there is the Supermaru Temple. Where that is located to this day is the governorate border. In ancient history, it was the border of Gnome 19. North of there, at the center of the Google Maps map, is Heracleopolis Magna. That was, at times, the capital of the majority of Egypt. 
North of there, you see that leaf shape. That's the Fayum Oasis. This is the very first reservoir where pharaohs would divert Nile waters, which used to overflow during peak high floods into this lake. The pharaohs, the Egyptians, converted this place into a reservoir where they could store vast volumes of Nile waters. I have a crocodile there because the city of Crocodilopolis was located there. At first, Neftahim being a deity, I figured there would be a deity which was linked with the knife that I was seeking. That's not the case. Turns out, yeah, the knife is so simple, anyone who's familiar with Egyptian gnomes would realize, well, that's the knife gnome. That's the borderline. So, top right, you see those two numbers. The bottom number, 22, that's the last gnome of Upper Egypt. Just north of it, the first gnome of Lower Egypt, that's Memphis. That is the great dividing line between Upper and Lower Egypt. So, in this case, Patras being south, that's far upper Egypt. Until my research, people had concluded that Patrasim referred to all of upper Egypt, which led them to searching remote locations for names like Lahabim and Neptahim. This is not the case. All of the Benay, the provinces of Egypt, are within Egypt proper. And now you can see how easy it is to understand. None of this is far-fetched. None of this is jumping around. None of it's a leap. It all passes the smell test, the KISS principle. This is how you know these are accurate. So, we now have provinces 5, 4, 3. They go in order, which leaves 2 and 1. We know they're going to be in Lower Egypt. We know that after Lahabim is on Amin, and it gets easy from there. On is Heliopolis. It's the sacred city of all Egypt. This is the place where Joseph is married to Asenat. He marries the daughter of the priest of On in Genesis. On happens to be on one side of Cairo and Memphis on the other side of Cairo. So we realize, so On Amim is the capital? Yes. Yes, it is. By that point, everything, once you go from Patrasim to Neftahim, it leads you to Lahabim. Once you see that the Neftis temple is the, the border, even today, of governorates, it's been the border of a land for many thousands of years. Lahabim is the knife which cuts upper and lower Egypt. It's a boundary today between the Cairo and the Fayum regions, and On is on the other side with the On Amim. Case closed. Now you understand the name order of B'nai Mitzrayim, the provinces of Egypt, solved. Five leads to four, four leads to three, and the rest makes complete sense. So as I was Speaking of the KISS principle and the smell test, common sense, things like that, these are tremendous tools which I have used in my research. They're always going to make sense because we hear people telling us, well, we can never understand the Bible completely. That is not true. It's not a truism. People say that only because they don't understand the Bible completely. But the people who wrote it down, my ancestors, my cousins, well, they understood it or else they would not have been able to write it down. It's understandable. If you look at this, no matter who you are, no matter what age you are, no matter how much background you had into the Bible beforehand, this is all completely understandable. Understand this also. In order for me to find these names in the B'nai Aram and all the names which I found, I had to find hundreds of names beyond Genesis, beyond the Exodus, and the only way to find them is to understand their meanings. Along that track, I found multiple tales which are 
ancient city mounds. I also found evidence to a migration event. There's already enough published to prove the migratory event. However, I want to speak with a geneticist for a genographic study. We can do a pointed study which establishes down to the generation the exact space-time, which in this case it's place-time, of the migration of these people. If you enjoyed this presentation, please see my additional presentations. Please pass the word on that this exists. I have mapped hundreds of names which had not been mapped. They all make sense, just as these make sense. If you see my Aram video, you'll realize, well, there's not that many, and they make sense. That's true. They're easy to understand, but up until now, they had not been identified. They are identified. If you would, please, see my Egypt map, my Bible Egypt map, on Facebook Marketplace. It's affordable, it's beautiful, and it is the only complete and accurate map of biblical Egypt that has existed. If you would please purchase this map, I'm raising funds so that I can publish the complete map of Genesis so we can understand the Bible completely. I know where all of the names are located. I also have a GoFundMe page. I'm not asking for much, I'm just asking for enough to publish this Bible. Please pass the word on that this map exists and my YouTube channel where I will keep posting tutorials which explain the Bible. If you are in contact with any researchers, please let them know that you have viewed this video and that it makes sense enough, enough to review the possibility that I very well may be correct about all of this, which you can judge for yourself based on these examples. Thank you for viewing this video. Once again, my name is Daniel Adam Fink. Please feel free to comment in my Arpakshad YouTube channel.